It's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, so you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons, presented by Endless Events. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. Use the question panel on the webinar to submit your questions. Or you can hop on Twitter. Submit your questions with hashtag event icons. We'll be answering your questions live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better conversation we can have. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter and Facebook. Just tell your friends to watch at www.event-icons.com. Com. Now, without any further delay, this is Hashtag Event Icons. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I was getting some double trouble feedback from our Facebook Live, but welcome. It's Wednesday. It's 5 p.m., and that means that you're spending time with us on Hashtag Event Icons. We're so happy to have you, and this show's about you. This is where you get to ask the icons of the industry just what's going on. Any questions that you want, it's your time. Please use the question panel for those who are connected via Facebook Live. Uh, go ahead and enter in your questions. If you're on Twitter, use hashtag event icons and we're here to listen and make this a live conversation. And before we get started, I do wanna say the more people that we have watching, that's the better conversation that we're going to have. So please do share hashtag event icons on Twitter, Facebook, or you can just tell your friends, hop on www.events-icons.com and we look forward to being with you there. So today is a very special and important topic and it's the topic of how we can get as event professionals to inbox zero, which is fleeting, desperate, and a dream that we all have. And this is really a reality check, whether you're an entrepreneur, an event professional for a large organization, small organization, this whole idea is centered around having defined processes and not just in our head, right? How do we create this for the company that we work for? Um, and of course for ourselves. And so it starts with the inbox, but we know that it's so much more than that. So during this hour that we're all invested in, our plan is to save you days, weeks, to grow your organization, to be the future that it wants, to have the future that it wants. If you're not running it, how do you influence from the inside? So today we're so happy to have Chris Ronzio to join us and tell us his story. And he's the founder of Train Your Role, which is actually a platform for entrepreneurs to get their business out of their brain by documenting and delegating the processes in their company. So this is all interrelated to Inbox Zero and we're so happy to have you, Chris. How you doing? I'm awesome. Thanks so much for having me. When, uh, when, when you were doing the opening and we had the audio feedback, I thought what better way to start a show about the event industry <laughs> than a live video problem? Because I know I've got to have my fair share of those. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. This is actually going to be my last show with event icons because that happens. So we're just going to soak it up, soak it up for as long as it or I did okay. it on purpose. Let's go with that. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> So Chris, you've obviously have, have been a part of this world of Inbox Zero and have actually been through a number of organizations built by you to kind of be a solution to processes. And so uh, we know that you've worked through a number of industries. What had you focus on the event industry specifically from a training perspective? So my background, my first company that I ever started was when I was 14 years old. I had a video production company that did youth sporting events. It was called EVC, the event video company, which awesome. I thought was, you know, just like NBC or ABC, but I was the event guy. So it started in Boston where I'm from and through high school, through college, after college, um, I ended up with over 300 camera operators doing events in all 50 states. And so that experience of first being in the event industry, doing live events, you know, training contractors, employees, setting up offices was just an amazing experience. Mm. And I get my hands dirty in so many different areas of business. So when I sold that company, Back in 2013, um, I looked back and I, I looked at everything I had done, all the systems, all the processes, and decided to get into operational uh, consulting. So how could I help other businesses build out their systems and processes? How could I help them be more efficient, save time, save mm -hmm. money, be productive, all this stuff that we're going to talk about today? 
ended up investing in a few companies and then out of that started Trainual, which I'm sure we'll talk more about later. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for a lot of folks who have and, and can empathize with what you've gone through where you learn as you go, right? You fail over and over again, and then you end up hopefully with a system that works. How long did it take you to achieve that with your first company? Um, I don't think it's something you ever achieve. You fair, know, there's, <laughs> there's no finish line when it Good. comes to improving your processes and everything. But, um, you know, it was, it was constant iterations. You know, for us, especially with live events and with video, we were changing cameras out like every three months or six months because mm. technology was changing so quickly. You know, when I started the business, we didn't even edit on computers. We had like, v, you know, VCRs and stuff. And, and so when you think about how much video has changed in the last 10 or 15 years when it went from those VCRs to like HD live streaming on Facebook with yeah. you know your iPhone it's like a crazy different world so process evolution and just being um, comfortable with change was central to our success so let's actually ride that wave. I want to talk about that because I think behind a good process is adopting something new and being willing to change up how your day-to-day -day functionality looks, which is probably a, a breakthrough conversation that you influence for organizations to, to start to think differently. Is that something that you handle through your organization now at Trainual? Yeah, so with Trainual, companies can document every process in their company, and people sign up for different reasons. You know, sometimes they're hiring a lot of people, they've got a lot of training to do. Mm -hmm. Some companies just want to build the operations manual for their business or the playbook for their business or their SOPs. And so the, the reason they sign up is different, but the result is always the same, which is they want something that is the company sanctioned way of doing things. Right. Uh, and they want it formally documented so everyone does it consistently. And so um, I think, you know, that's what process is all about is taking a stand, even if it's at one point in time and tomorrow it's going to change. It's saying, as of now, I am confident that this is the way we do things and let me write it down so I can give it to someone else to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And so f there's going to be, be people who are listening right now um, that are either key stakeholders in their company, they might be owning the company, or they might just be someone who's witnessing processes that is basically the workaround, right? And I, even in my organization, you know, we, we talk about, let's say the invoicing process and we shrug and we say, well, you know, it's just how it is. That's just what mm -hmm. we do here. And so you're dealing with inefficiencies as opposed to making things better. So if you are that person who um, doesn't necessarily have a tremendous amount of influence, but you're recognizing that there's opportunity to really optimize your systems. Do you have those folks reach out to you to start to have that conversation to influence? Have you, have you been through that process before? Yeah, I think anyone at any level in a company can be the one that drives the change. For, yeah. for real change to happen, you've got to get the buy-in of, of everyone or get, you know, especially at the top. But mm -hmm. I've seen it come from all different levels where somebody wants things to change. And I know, you know, when, when I was doing the consulting, I interviewed face-to-face -face over a thousand people over the last few years. Wow. and. Nice employees sometimes are scared to recommend different ways to do things because they think, oh, I don't, what do I know? You know, I, I'm pretty new. This guy's been here longer. They've exactly. probably tried that before. Exactly. And I think that needs to go out the window because if you're seen as someone in the company that wants to change, that wants to improve, that wants to save money, that wants to save time, you're going to go really far in the organization. Whereas if you're just the type of person that's afraid to change, you know, wants the job security, doesn't yeah. mind doing like the manual labor a thousand times <laughs> all day, every day, you know, like you have to be okay complaining. Yeah. You have to be, you know, and don't see it as a negative, see it as you're optimizing the business. And yes. you've got to recognize that the leaders, the business owners, if that's not you, will appreciate that. And enormously you know if you if anyone came to me and said hey I found this way for us to save uh, three hours each week I'd be like clear my schedule right. <laughs> let's sit down and talk <laughs> about it. it you know yes absolutely so is this where train your old comes in so I think for a lot of people let's say okay I've identified the problem I know that I can save the organization time I just don't know how to organize this is this where you all come in 
Yeah. So training was like the next step after okay. you've identified the inefficiencies. So um, actually, let me walk that back. So if you're using Trainual to outline your processes, <clears throat> many companies will start to do it. They'll go down that path and they'll realize as they build out step one, step two, step three, step four, and get other people's feedback on it that, hey, maybe there's a better way to do this. I didn't realize there were so many steps. Mm. So you can have those revelations just through the exercise of writing things down. It's funny. We have... Um, we have like this checklist on our website and these, I printed these notepads and I give them out to everybody that it's, it's, you know, we live in such a digital world now, but I give out these like analog notepads and on our website, we say it's our most basic plan. Um, but it's, it's like a free checklist where you can just literally put like step by step by step by step, how you do a certain process. And that's the first thing, whether you're doing it on paper or using yep. a system or using Evernote or Google docs, like just starting to step by step sequence out something that you want to improve is the first place. So whether you are using Trainual or not, I think that's where you want to begin with any process that feels like you could do it better, write down what exists today and then start mm -hmm. to circle the things that are the bottlenecks or the things that like, um, I used to ask people, if you had a genie that could solve this whole thing, what just what would happen? What would it look yeah. like? Or if you had um, a an employee that only worked for you, no one else even knew about them. And they just came in at night and like did most <laughs> of your job. Like what would they do? But that question is awesome because it gets to the root of like, what's the stuff that drags me down that I spent so much time on. So I think that's where it starts is building like the list of things that you want to improve. And then the step by steps of how you do them today as a starting point. Mm. So I have obviously my event professional hat on and thinking about how many different lists an event planner, organizer manages. And I know you have a history obviously in the industry, so you know that so dearly. Mm -hmm. If you were going to help an event professional get started on thinking about managing these multiple processes in that granular way that you're talking about, what would be your advice? What's the, what's the thought behind it? So the easiest one, I mean, you, you can get really detailed and like you mentioned your invoicing process and stuff, but you know, every, within every process, there's another process, you know, like you keep, you go down a rabbit hole, yeah. but it, I think the, the core thing is, you know, from how do you get a lead in the door? What do you do with it? How do you follow up with them until it becomes like an event on your calendar? Mm -hmm. How do you staff that event? What do you need to prepare for the event? How do you execute the event? And then how do you get paid for the event? So from close, you know, close to cash or, you know, how, yeah. however, however you look at that core process, I think that's where to start is like, how do, how do we deliver the core of what we're doing and what does that look like? And then from there, like I said, you'll, you know, when you zoom out, you'll start to circle the areas that say like, oh, wow, our invoicing is ridiculously complicated. We yeah. never get paid on time. Let's zoom in on our invoicing and, and, you know, map that one out, but start with just the, the macro view. Right, exactly. And I think, you know, event professionals are masters of the work back schedule, right? So we book the event, we got to get it done. We know all the components, all the stakeholders and the moving parts, but it's, it's basically work back schedule on steroids, right? So it's mm -hmm. getting even more so. Um, and I read an article that you wrote recently that was great in breaking down how to create a list that helps you actually identify where there's opportunity for improvement. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so building, like I mentioned, building your, your list, your starting point of all the things you do to figure out how you can improve. I'm not sure which article exactly it was, but um, maybe what I was talking about was, you know, everybody has responsibilities or processes that they're responsible for. Yeah. And so for a person, you might have daily responsibilities, things you're doing every day. You might have weekly responsibilities. You might have bi-weekly ones like payroll, monthly ones, quarterly ones. So for every position in a company, you have all these little processes that are hats you're having to put on at some point in time. Mm -hmm. And so I think writing all that stuff down and identifying what all those things are just at an outline level is crucial because then, like I said, you figure out the ones that you know are urgent that you need to work on. Right. You don't need to work on everything. You know, what I tell people is the stuff that you need to document is the stuff that you want to delegate. You know, if, if well, you, if you know, yeah, if you know how you're doing something and you're doing it the same way every time and 
you know, you're, you're only doing it for yourself and maybe you document it like for some catastrophic situation or because you want to build out your full playbook, but the most urgent stuff is always going to be the stuff that you want to give to someone else. Mm. And so maybe it's, um, you know, event setup, or maybe it's, you just brought someone onto the team that's doing screening calls, um, you know, to, to qualify people, or maybe it's putting together estimates or proposals, or maybe it's the teardown at the event. You know, those things have a process to how you do them right. and wherever it is that you're going to bring other people in to help start to outline those processes. Absolutely. Well, we got, we got our first question in and uh, enthusiastically, Chris, Exclamation point. Uh, Mark, we all work in an industry where client demand seems to be, I needed this yesterday. So yeah. you're managing yourself. How do you set client expectations? There, it, it, so I like in the event industry is, is very much like uh, the customer service industry in any, in any business. Yeah. You know, every business right. has some type of customer service. And mm -hmm. especially as you approach an event's date, um, any request is an urgent request. And so when people talk about, you know, uh, t you know, time block your schedule and do this and do this, like, yeah, all that stuff goes out the window when the events tomorrow right. and like your and equipment rentals right. fell through and yeah. the fl flights were canceled by snow. And, you know, so it is a, like the nature of the business is an urgent business. And so you've mm -hmm. got to be um, great at prioritizing what's the most urgent uh, versus like medium urgent and then yeah. kind of urgent because there is no <laughs> not urgent, right? So, um, so I think, you know, if, if a client wants everything yesterday, there's certain things you can set expectations on just by telling them, um, what, you know, telling them when you'll get it to them. I think mm -hmm. if you leave it open-ended, then that's when you might get five follow-ups where if you said, oh, I'll have this to you Thursday at noon, then you know, as long as you stick to that, you've, you've held up your end of the bargain. So I think um, if you're feeling like there's some extra pressure on you, um, maybe try setting an expectation. If you can't set an expectation because this must be resolved now and you agree that it's a problem for now, then you just got to do it and it knocks other things down, down the line. So, um, so then the next part would be, do you need help? You know, if you are a okay. hundred percent focused on urgent issues that you need to resolve immediately and yeah. everyone needs an instant response and you don't feel like you can do it all. Well, chances are there's more work than any human should have to, <laughs> should have to juggle. Right. Yeah. And, and if that's the case, then that's a different conversation about capacity and staffing. Yeah, absolutely. Staying on the client front, have you advised people ever on managing clients? So say you're, you have a new process that you've adopted. Can you upskill clients on that and kind of manage their expectations on how to work with you better? So say, for example, um, well, we were talking about inbox today. So let's say there's an, an emailing flow or communication flow that you prefer to work through? Have you advised people to talk about that externally ever? So like, have I coached clients on the, on the inbox zero? Or do you mean, have I uh, communicated the, an expectation of my process just so they're in the loop? Let's, let's go with the second. Yeah. Okay. So how, how do you communicate your process externally? So, um, so with the video company, when I was in the event industry, it was all of our proposals included the, in the, the schedule, the timeline of like, you know, day one, this is going to happen. And it's a relative schedule usually from when mm -hmm. you sign the contract. So it was like day one, this happens, day seven, this happens, day 14, this happens. Mm -hmm. We would load those things into a project management system, which at the time we used Basecamp. I've used several systems since then, but, um, classic. Yeah, that was back in the day, right? Um, so, so I think that the more you communicate up front, here's what you just purchased. Here's what you're getting into with us. And you take the lead and the authority mm -hmm. of here's the, what the experience is going to be like. Then you get the opportunity to dictate that experience where if you just take someone's money and then they can't even get you on the phone and they're like, what's going on? Yeah. Then, then th like the, am I getting screwed over? That exactly. starts to like roll through their mind right. and then they're all over you. And then you're getting, you know, mm -hmm. 10 times the number of emails and the questions. But if you're noticing I'm getting all these questions as the event leads up, well, maybe create a form where you capture all that information on day two 
<laughs> you know, right. and then that makes the client feel better that th that they're like, oh, I'm going to give them this because they haven't asked for it, you know, yeah. but it also makes your process smoother because you have everything up front in one place. Right. So, you know, it's about communicating your process early on in your process and then refining it as you realize like why people are bothering you later on in the in the planning, you know, how can you rectify that early on proactively? Right. right. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. That's great. So I do want to make sure we talk about the elephant in the room, which okay. is Inbox Zero. So, Let's do it. You know, the size processes, and of course, this is all interrelated, undoubtedly. But um, for those of us who long to manage our inbox and we just can't, how do we get started on this? Is this actually achievable? And what does your inbox look like today? I, I knew you were going to ask me that. So I have, <laughs> I have five emails right now. Damn, so, so yeah, I was looking at my, my five emails. Um, so, so inbox zero, like you mentioned at the, in the intro is like this fleeting thing that, you know, you're, you don't get to inbox zero and never get an email again. It's, it's more of a methodology of how to stay on top of the communication, you know? Right. So my consulting company was called Organized Chaos. And people love the name because as you're getting busy in business, it feels like chaos. And I would tell people chaos is a great thing. If you're feeling that overwhelming sense of chaos, it's because things are happening that are, are good for business. There's activity, right? right? Unless you feel like, like I said, you're just doing this manual like computer task all day and, and you think there's, you know, you need to, you need to fix that. But, but if you're busy and you're juggling a lot of urgent things, that's good. The business, it means the business is thriving. Exactly. So now it's all about how do we process everything that's coming at us really, you know, really well. Mm -hmm. The first thing you can do if you're get, if you feel like you're getting thousands of uh, messages coming at you is of course redirect some of those messages to other people. So mm -hmm. if there is a web request on your uh, your website and that any submission comes to you and you end up just like printing it out and handing to someone or forwarding to someone, change the web form to go to them. You know, there's, so there's simple things that maybe should be other people's roles that you don't need to be CC'd on everything. That's mm -hmm. like an easy, low hanging fruit. Yep. Next is a tool I always recommend to people and it's called SaneBox, S-A-N-E-B-O-X. Um, there's a couple other tools out there. I'll tell you why I like SaneBox. Another one is called Unroll Me, Unrolled okay. M-E. Um, I prefer Sandbox because of the, some of the filters and rules that they have. But basically what those tools do is it acts as like a, a guardian, a bodyguard for your inbox where um, you've got all these messages coming at you. A lot of them are just like Facebook notifications or receipts from something you purchased or yeah. reminders about the live Facebook stream you have to do tomorrow mm -hmm. <laughs> or, you know, like all those emails you get that aren't personal correspondence from another person that's like, hi, Chris, this, I'm a real person and we met yesterday. Right. You know, so I think the best thing you can do is screen all of that optional stuff out of your inbox because very few of us have time for optional stuff, sure. but yet we let it sneak into our life and it ends up uh, distracting us throughout the day. So get that optional stuff out of your inbox first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And same box is a great tool for that. Okay. So now say you've like offloaded as much email as you can and you've screened out as much email as you can, then how do you process what's left? Right. So first thing is um, you probably have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of emails in your inbox. And if you don't operate with the mentality of cleaning out your inbox and chances are, it's just built up like crazy over the years. The analogy I use here is uh, think about your physical mailbox, like at the bottom of your driveway or at the intro to your neighborhood or your apartment building or whatever it is. Do you go and check your mail and look in your physical mailbox and you take a few letters out and you look at them and you're like, okay, cool. Okay. I'm going to take this one. And then you stuff everything else back into <laughs> your, your mailbox and just walk away. No, no one does that. But like, then imagine the mail guy come in there, girl come in the next day and trying to put mess new mail in there. And then the next day you're like, Oh, what have I already seen? What have I like, oh, I opened that one, let me put that one back at the bottom. Like, imagine how unorganized your physical mailbox would be if yeah. that's how you operated. 
but that's how most people operate with their inbox. So start to train your mind that your inbox mm. is something you have to clear out every mm. day. And so the, the goal is that every day that you sit down, you're going to get to zero and you're going to do that through processing. Now, if you're not at zero now, or you're at like a hundred thousand, then there's a, a couple ways that you could go Just about this. Delete it all. <laughs> yeah, definitely one option <laughs> might be hard if you need to reference something later, yeah, but exactly. so, so yeah, there's, there's a, another cool app I recommend called Maelstrom. Uh, it's M A I L S T R O M. Okay. Uh, cool. So Maelstrom is a, a tool. It links with, uh, with, you know, Google apps and Outlook and Yahoo and all those things. And basically what they do is they process all the mail in your account, all the mail in your inbox. And they let you start to do rules and, and things like if I, if I haven't, uh, if it has a file attachment that's bigger than this, archive it or move it to this folder or delete it. If it's from any of these senders like Facebook and Twitter and this and that, just like archive or delete it. Um, and, and so it's a really easy way to process through your mail to see if there's anything from months ago that might've slipped through the cracks. So that's one tool if you're really concerned with what's in there. The next way to do this is just go back in your, you go back a few pages in your inbox to maybe a few weeks ago and anything older than that, select all and archive or in a different email system. It might be, I think Outlook says sweep, or I think, uh, you know, there's a way to just move something to a different folder, but whatever the technicality is of the system you use, get it out of your inbox. So select all that stuff and get rid of it. If you feel like there is no salvaging your email and it's beyond the point of, of being able to clean up, then just declare bankruptcy and <laughs> set an auto responder on your email account and say, I, my email just totally crashed or it's beyond re repair. And if you're a real person and you know me, please use this email address now. And then you're kind of like, you get a fresh start with a different email address. Right. So there's a few ways you can go about that. Um, but once, once you've got your, you know, all the old stuff cleared out, let's say you got to zero your first time, then the, the real art is how do you stay at zero? I know I'm just like talking and talking and talking. This is, is this great. useful or okay? Absolutely. So <clears throat> the real art is, is how to stay at zero. So I usually draw this out. I wish I had a whiteboard behind me actually, but, um, Think about when all the mail comes into your, into your inbox and you sit down and you say, okay, I'm going to clean, I'm going to clear through my email right now. Um, the, the system I use is called the four D's. It's kind of from the getting things done methodology. Um, so uh, first thing, when you look at all those emails is, can you uh, delete something? So the, the first D is delete. Just like if you're standing at your physical mailbox, you see a junk mail or a magazine you didn't want, you throw it in the trash, right? right? So delete's easy. Next is uh, delegate. So that would be forwarding the email. So if you've, mm -hmm. got, if you've got a message that, you know, it really involves someone else or you don't need to be on it, forward it to someone else and just let them handle it. The next D is actually do it. So if the task in the email is like, hey, your password expired and reset your password or your credit card expired or it's a real quick question from someone and it's going to take you like less than a minute or less than two minutes to just reply to that and replying to it is the task. That's all you have to do. Then reply to it and be done with the email. Now, in all of those situations, delete, obviously, it's out of your inbox. Mm -hmm. De uh, delegate or forward as soon as you forwarded it to someone else you archive it or move it out of your inbox and then do it if you've actually replied and it's handled then you archive it and move it out of your inbox think of that that inbox is like a shrinking to-do list as you start right. to process those things so now whatever's left whatever messages are are left uh, in your account the the next thing the the final D is, uh, is to defer. And so defer could be, I'm going to do it this afternoon and right. you just leave it in your inbox mm -hmm. or defer could be a couple other things. It could be, I'm going to put the task here on my to-do list or in my project management system. And then I'm going to get rid of the email or it could be, I'm going to put a calendar, uh, something on the calendar for myself because it's a, I'm going to call this person at a certain time. So you do that and then you get rid of the email. Hmm. Or you could snooze the email, which means that the actual, the content of the email is important, but I don't need it right now. I'm going to snooze it and say, go away, come back in 
three weeks or come back mm -hmm. on April 30th or whatever it is. Um, and a tool I use for snoozing or doing that uh, is called uh, Gmailius. I use Gmail. There's another tool um, called Boomerang, which maybe you've been familiar with mm -hmm. that works in Outlook. Um, there's another one that's uh, followup.cc. So all these tools are the same principle, which is let me dictate when this message should come back to me. You know, like I, I do this all the time when I get our our uh, statements from uh, for our, our rent in the office. Um, the in, it, it takes me two seconds and I instantly snooze it until the last possible day when I know I have to pay the rent, you know? <laughs> and then when it comes back, that it, at that time I do, I, I yeah. actually do the task, you know? Yeah. So, um, so that's, that's, uh, that's the process of the four Ds. So again, it's delete, then delegate, then do it, then defer it. And in all cases, you're clearing out your inbox. So the result at the end of a processing session like that is an empty inbox that you can actually feel really good about so that now you can shut down your email or put your email aside and go back to the proactive work of let me work from my to-do list, from right. my project management system, from my calendar, the things that I actually wanted to get done instead of being captive to my email all day. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's kind of the process in a nutshell. I want to, I, that was great. And I appreciate you taking the time to go through that because it, there are so many different decisions to be made as you're looking at your beast of an inbox. And the, I think one of the hardest is delegation. So how do you pass off assignments or tasks in a way that doesn't just drown someone else's inbox or makes them feel like, well, why isn't this person just getting it done? How do you balance that fine line of, of delegation? So this is going to be a weird analogy, but it's kind of like a waterfall of cups or something where imagine if the top cup overfill overflows and it starts to pour into the next layer of cups. And then once those cups overflow, there needs to be a next layer of cups to catch all the water. Yeah. Think of the water as like the, the work in your company. And if you're just a solo person, then you, you know, you go and you go and you go until you can fill up the cup. And then, and then maybe you're just like, you know, treading water, trying to keep the it from overflowing for a while, right? And then eventually, you 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 get a contractor, and there's like a tray below you. You know, yeah. or eventually <laughs> you you add a couple other people to your team, and there's like some other cups below you. And so when you're forwarding something or delegating something on to someone else, it's with the expectation that it's part of their role in the business. And as long as they're subscribed to the same sort of inbox zero processing methodology, which I teach to everyone, um, then you know that they're your email is just going to, the task in there is going to go on their calendar. It's going to go on their to-do list. You're going to get a reply if it's a question um, because this system is <clears throat> the, the beauty of this system is that nothing slips through the cracks. You've addressed, you've, you've made it, you've done an action and addressed every email in your inbox. So right. nothing slips through the, the cracks. So if I forward something to one of my employees, I know that they're going to handle it. And if for some reason they're not able to handle it or their cup is full, then we as a company need to talk about which responsibilities should be shifted off their plate. Exactly, Do we need yeah. to bring in extra help? Do we need to hire a vendor? So, so it's just a constant discussion around capacity. Yeah, absolutely. And something that you said really stood out to me is that if we are going to be successful about inbox zero, mm -hmm. that means essentially, and kind of coming back to train you all, training in its simplest form is learning a process in which everyone can work within one adopted system, right? We all need to be bought in, in theory, with this, this same process. So is that, does train you all help with that through training? So it, it, and, and it's an e-learning platform. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So train you all started off as, you know, I, I mentioned my experience with my video production mm -hmm. company. Um, back when we had uh, when we were, we had that company, um, like I said, we had over 300 camera operators, and we would hire people in all different markets around the country um, to show up and do events, and they had to do it with 
our particular system. So there needed to be some sort of training in advance of them just showing up that day um, so that, you know, they looked the part, they acted the part, they, they knew what they were responsible for. Um, you know, we did a lot of youth sporting events and uh, our feeds would go to jumbotrons, would go to uh, judging for technical scoring. And so it really mattered sometimes um, that people were trained appropriately. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the way we did it is we had a, a WordPress site where we tried to communicate all the how to's. We used a, a, a tool called Wufu for a, it's a form tool and we made like yeah. hack together little quizzes. And then we had uh, scheduled emails that would remind people to do the training. And it was really just a duct tape together training system. And so when I started to create Trainual, it was how do I solve all of those problems of making it easy to communicate step-by-step -step processes mm -hmm. and then take those processes and group them into roles in the company so that when I invite someone to the system, they just instantly have access to everything they need to know. Right. And then how do I hold the people accountable by first having them mark complete when they've done something so I can see that they've gone through it all and then have tests if you want to quiz people on certain things. And so mm -hmm. all of that is built into Trainual. So it's sort of a hybrid between like a wiki or an intranet where, right. you know, you start to describe things. Yes. Um, but it also has the learning e-learning component where you can assign and complete things. Right. So does that help? describe it yeah, absolutely and i'm i'm thinking about meeting and event organizations whether you're a tiny organization uh five people or hundreds of thousands how does trainual come in and help with that kind of delegation and i really like the alignment that you talked about so you come into trainual you obviously are adopting new processes, you're learning, but you also know your role in it right away. Mm -hmm. So what is my responsibility? That's yeah. assigned to you. That's really powerful. Yeah. So people knowing their role, <clears throat> again, when I was doing the consulting, that was one of the pieces of feedback that I got was there's yeah. so much gray area and I'm not sure mm -hmm. if I'm doing a good job. Like what is expected of me? So to, to have a manual that's crystal clear that says, here's all the things you need to know. It's great for the employee. It's also great for the manager because now if someone does something incorrectly you can actually in you you have an expectation you can point back to that says you were trained on this at this time and this day and you marked it as complete so it's it's really healthy for the organization on both sides um in the event industry so there's there's so much training you know so for us we had to train people first on the context of what they were showing up to do you know, if you hire someone off Craigslist to do a particular type of event, like give them a little bit of context on, you know, what, what's the industry and what is the purpose of, of like this, the, the decor we're setting up or the tables we're setting up or, you know, what is this that yeah. that's helpful. It just, per, it, it makes it a little more personal so that the, the person is bought in. Um, then next, you maybe some information about your company, you know, like what's the history of the company? Who's the, the team? Where's the, what's the founding story? Okay. Again, all all of that is really going to engage your people, whether they're contractors or employees. And then there's the, the specific how to's, you know, how do you unload a truck? How do you pack a gear full of equipment? Like where should you show up if you're at a particular venue? All those things are really important. Um, in the event space, another thing we did is particular events have unique processes and challenges based right. on the venue or based on the client. And so we used to create a training, a documentation around a specific event. Like we would have a massive graduation ceremony that we would do the production for. Mm -hmm. And every year, like a few weeks before the thing, it was like, Oh crap. How did we do this? I like, what, if, <laughs> what, what gear did we use? Like, what do I need to rent? How many people do I need to have there? Yeah. How, you know, like, what time did we get there? Where was the power? I forgot all about that issue, you know? So the best time to document uh, how you do a particular event is right after the event happened right. when it's all fresh in your, in your mind. So you have kind of like a debrief with your, with your team where you sit down and you say, what were all the challenges that we had? What were the like intricacies for this particular client, for this particular venue? Let's put all that in the system, especially as if it's going to be a recurring venue or a recurring client. Let's document that. So that next year, we don't have to scramble and try to like remember from a year ago, you know, and the guy that is no longer with us and you know, right. all this so sort one of person with all the information. <laughs> yeah. Like you have a system where you can look for it. And that's the yeah. other powerful thing 
about trainual is it's not just training. I know that's half the word, but manual is <laughs> that the other half of the word. And so everything is searchable. So if mm -hmm. you were to search for like a client name or a piece of equipment's name or a, 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 a process you guys have or your project management software, then all of the documented stuff comes right up anywhere that word is. So it's really easy to find, you know, if, I, if I'm just looking for a particular process or a policy in the company, you know, it's, it's really right. easy to find it. Yeah. And I, you know, it's what you said, just, I had an aha moment, you know, having run many of events over time and the first conversation that we have, obviously, you know, looking at the surveys and hoping that more than 15% of the people who attend take a survey and that sort of thing and getting those kind of impact metrics. Obviously we successfully executed the event. Great. We're checking the box, but not so much analyzing processes. And I think the reason being is behind analyzing a process is a lot of truth and a lot of work that has to get done to better it. And so for organizations that have been around for a longer time, it's easier to avoid those conversations because it feels like just in seemingly impossible to change a process for something that's so massive and so big. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm taking us back to where we started and thinking about, again, if I'm that person who recognizes the need for change and may not have influence, what are those first steps? So I'm going to role model my behavior in wanting to change my day-to-day -day functionality and talking with others about it. But if you're working for a massive organization, how do you, how do you try to influence that? So one thing I've seen work is you know, if you, if you come in guns blazing with your idea and you tell everyone the solution, then you're going to get some resistance because right. for whatever reasons, you know, people might have had some ownership in the past solution. They might have, have, uh, you know, just they're, they're comfortable day to day. Mm. They've got a lot else on their plate and they don't want to tackle this right now. So I think the best way to come into it is to, to get consensus around the problem. So you talk to people and you right. say, man, that, you know, this took me a long time. Have you ever done, had to do this? And you, right. you, you let the them mind. say, yeah, that's, that all is always take a long time. And you'd yeah. be like, does anyone else complain about this? And, oh yeah, this person, you know, she, like she did it before me and, and, uh, she didn't like it either. So you go over that person, you start to build this case of like, we kind of all agree this, right. this particular process could be improved. Would it be okay if we went out and looked for some ideas and came back and presented that? And, you know, when, when you go at it from that angle, then, you know, no one's going to say like, no, you may not work on improving the company. You know? <laughs> like, you know, so you, you you've got to, you, you just have to come at it as, as a constructive discovery, whatever. And then, and then you come in and you say, Hey, remember a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about this. Well, on my off hours or whatever, you know, I, I came across this thing and, and do you think that the company would be open to, to changing this if we could X, Y, and Z. And, you know, you start to just uh, to introduce the idea and, you know, things and especially in big companies don't happen overnight uh, because right. there's, there's a lot of politics involved, but um, if you can, uh, uh, you know, on a person to person level, start to build a case around a change that you want to make. Um, I think that's an effective way to get it done. Yeah. Build your buy-in. Absolutely. And so when you, you have your clients working through train your wall, how much of gamification do you use to engage with this process? Does that help with getting buy-in with using a new system? So gamifying the new system. Yeah. yeah. So in Trainual, um, everything that you do is uh, has a completion percentage and it's okay. kind of like completing your LinkedIn profile or something. Mm -hmm. And so as you, when you first log into Trainual, you, the company usually has assigned you a role or has, you know, whatever goes with your job. And the system is encouraging you to go through and acknowledge everything, read through mm -hmm. everything, mark it all as completed. And if you haven't, so every, every, uh, you know, week of inactive, activity or something, it prompts you and says, hey, you're 84% of, uh, of the way through the material. So it's encouraging you to get in there and get 100% uh, through it. So, so the system does gamify completion a little bit um, because really what we're all after is that everybody understands what their job is and everyone understands the best way to do their job, right? Yeah. Like I think everyone wants to be efficient. Everyone 
hopes that they could do things as easily as possible. No one likes doing things the hard way. So the point of the system is to take all of the company's best practices and say, this is how we as a company think things are done. If, if somebody can improve one of those, then that's for the benefit of everyone, you know, and anyone that would be related to that particular process, if it does change is Mm -hmm. instantly updated by our system. So you don't have to like make a new document and email it all out to everybody. So, so it, it does gamify keeping people up to speed. That's great. Yeah. And it makes it more accessible. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you about this idea of multitasking and people who say that they're good multitaskers. Does that at all influence the way that you process or I should say manage your processes? Is multitasking a myth? Is it real and something that can be a good thing? And especially an event planner who is managing so much at once wants to, you know, make their inbox manageable, but the reality is that there's so much going on at one time. Um, So if you identify as a multitasker, what do you think? Is that a good thing, bad thing, neutral? I think uh, the idea of being a mindless multitasker is, can happen because if, if things are, if you, you kind of run on autopilot on doing certain things and if you're doing those things, you know, and multitasking across those things and they just come so naturally, you don't even have to think about them. Mm -hmm. Then, then you're really just playing operator and you're really just like, you know, hitting a bunch of switches and, and um, you know, like Mm -hmm. the little like mole that pops up and you're just like, boop, 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 (laughs) boop, boop, you know? And so, and so I think that is possible and that you can actually be a very efficient, fast worker. You know, some people confuse uh, multitasking with just being, really proficient and fast and they like and right. they, they get like a uh you know i'm like that i i, I get excited when i'm just like oh i just got so much done yeah. like i just burn through you know but i think anything that needs to be done quality mm-hmm. needs very focused attention because mm-hmm. if you try to do things that require you to think then you're going to mess things up if you're doing multiple at once yeah. you know like like if i was if I was doing this, uh, this call with you and then I had another laptop right here and I like paused this and then went into another conversation, like I'm not listening to your questions. I'm yeah. going to screw things up. This is a very focused thing. So, so that was a long way of answering that. If they're mindless tasks, I think you can just Go for it. zip through them. And yeah. if they're focused attention, creative kind of tasks, you need to be uh, dedicated. Yeah, and a lot of that is time management. And, and I do think brings us back to this idea of inbox zero. It doesn't mean answering emails while you're in the middle of a meeting or on the phone, which I'm sure we're all guilty of doing. But at the end of the day, you're not being productive with that kind of practice and you're not giving the right kind of attention for your, for your business. Um, yeah. But you know, a lot of folks say, well, inbox zero, doesn't that just mean answering all my emails right away? And doing it as fast as I possibly can. And that's, that's far from the point, right? No, it's so actually great point with the multitasking. So um, when I go on vacation and I don't check my email on vacation, uh, I will come back from vacation and I'll have hundreds of messages in my inbox and it might take me an hour and I get through all of them. Right. But if I got those same hundred emails, or a few hundred emails over the course of the week, I bet I spent way more time in my inbox looking at those things than I did when I just had the focused hour to blow through them all. So, um, so I think inbox zero doesn't mean that you're like, um, you know, the, the tennis ball machine and it's just like, don't, go, go, don't, go. Don't, you know, it, yeah. it, it means that like you can be disciplined about mm-hmm. I'm going to do this work right now. And then as soon as I finish this task, now let me check in with my email. Is there anything urgent? Let me process this. That goes on my to-do list. Forward that, archive that. Okay, I'm done with my email. Back to this, you know? And then, and then it, later in the day, you're like, okay, I've got, you know, seven or eight emails built up that I actually need to do something with. Now let me focus on email and let me, and let me work on that for the next hour and, because I, I've really got to think about it and that's where I'm going to put my focused attention. So um, it's, it's about... Uh, uh, de- you know, f- directing your focus right. and and processing your email, but not replying to and, and being present in your email all day. 
Right, right. And you made me think about the dreaded email pop-up while you're in a meeting or working on a task and you're and you see a very important client sends you an email with some thoughts and next steps on a project that you're really close to closing so you want to follow that bright and shiny object and then you remember oh wait i need to finish up this contract so how do you how do you manage that does it mean I'm just going to turn, I'm just going to close my inbox, make sure that my phone doesn't have notifications? How do you manage distractions? Because I think that's inherently part of this whole process. So I, I turn notifications off on my phone and, you know, I don't, I don't have emails pop up on my phone. Those have been off for as long as I can remember um, or on my desktop. So email to me is I am, I am in, I always have a tab open. So I've always got my email tab open, but I'm not working in my email, but I, you know, at, in between tasks, I check back because I'm, I am constantly processing my email. I'm not constantly replying to things, but I'm constantly checking in to make sure there's nothing that I've been waiting for or yeah. whatever, you know? So, yeah. so it's, you don't get distracted in, in uh, Gmail or in G suite. Um, I actually use a view where it separates your red messages from your unread messages and I will collapse the unread messages so that they're not a distraction for me if I'm no. working on getting right. through the other ones, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it does take a little bit of discipline, but, um, you know, I, I think in terms of communication, um, I always tell people if it's urgent, text or call me. If okay. it's, you know, if it's like, you know, I can get back to you in a day or two, email me. And um, that's sort of the expectation I try to set. Right. And with clients, sometimes you establish that flow where they get used to you replying to them right away, as opposed to for me, um, you know, my job is very client facing. I give myself a 24 hour rule. So yeah. as long as if it's an external, you know, stakeholder that I need to stay in communication with, as long as it's within a 24 hours, 24 hour period, I'm good. But that doesn't mean that I have to do it right away. And it takes a bit of the pressure off. Right. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you as well is thinking about folks who own their own businesses and it might be a team of say three people mm -hmm. or maybe they're an entrepreneur building in the process of the building phase. And like you said earlier, you know, so much just stays in our brain sometimes and we don't actually put pen to paper. Yeah. So for those who are those independent contractors out there, who don't have the opportunity to delegate, how would you advise them to get started in Inbox Zero or managing their processes in a way that's, that's better for them? So if you don't have the ability to delegate just because you don't have people, uh, you don't have full-time employees or contractors, you can still get started delegating with virtual assistants, for there instance. Nice. Yeah, so, so a tool I used forever is called Fancy Hands, and it starts at like <laughs> $30 a month. And I, I believe that everyone needs a virtual assistant, whether you own the business or you're just an entry-level employee, um, because there's for all of us, there's certain things that we just don't have time to do or we could use a, an extra hand with. And so... Um, delegate a virtual assistant is great practice for delegation and being able to just send someone something. Um, the other thing I would say about that is um, I think everyone could delegate. It's really just a decision about, uh, you know, like say I was on the salary at a company. Mm -hmm. If I, if I wanted to, I bet the company would let me hire a full-time personal assistant and their salary might be equal to mine and I have to pay them. And so I just make no money, but I could delegate. Right. And right. so I think if you're the business owner, you've got to think about, you know, whatever money you're making in the business, you could earmark for hiring that next person. And if hiring that next person means it's going to free you up and it'll be uncomfortable, uncomfortable for a little, and you won't make as much money or maybe no money. But a few months later with your focused effort on the thing you really want to be working on, think of how right. far you'll be, you know? Right. So, so the, the myth of I can't afford it or I can't delegate, mm -hmm. I think everyone can, can afford it temporarily as much as their credit card limit will let them. You know? <laughs> and, that, and, and if we want to grow our organizations, we've got to be comfortable getting uncomfortable in yeah. that area so, so that you can delegate and you can get yeah. help. And you, you know. Yeah, a hundred percent. And you know, one theme that I'm hearing today that I'm surprised by and encouraged by is that 
inbox zero doesn't mean you're getting your work done necessarily faster. It's creating space for you to get work done in a way that is efficient and productive for you and takes the weight of a really always large workload that we're not, you know, that's just the reality for most people, but it's creating space to get work done in a way that's more efficient. And that's something that I'm really taking away and, and, um, not getting sappy about it, but giving yourself permission to do that, <laughs> especially if you're at a company that's not adopting that practice. So making the choice of how am I going to be an influencer? Um, so I, and I'm conscious of time, Chris, and I do want to ask you a question we always ask our guests. If you had uh, one piece of advice based off of our conversation today that you would want to pass off to our uh, event professionals listening in, what would you say? I think the, you know, to play off your last point there, yeah. the, the philosophy, the idea of in, inbox zero applies to all areas of your life. You know, there are areas in our life where we feel burdened, just like the burden of having a ton of mail in your, your email. There are relationships that maybe we haven't caught up with in a while. And we feel like we've got this full inbox of people we got to get back to. You know, there is uh, stuff around the house to do is that you want to get to, but, and every time you walk around your house and you see things, you're like, Oh, I really want to fix that. Those are like yeah. emails that are sitting in your inbox that you just keep looking at and you don't open, you know? So we have this, this idea of inbox zero is this universal thing. And I think the main idea I want people to get is to be comfortable letting things pile up and then process them, you know, pile and then process because it's okay, things pile up, but you've got to make time for yourself to process those to just make a list of what, who, you know, if it's the relationships, what's, who do I want to get back to? Who do I want to just unfriend? Who do I want to, you know, write a letter to or call, you know, and, and the same way that you would prioritize those kind of communications or the projects around your house, you would do with your email, but it's really just be okay. Understand that if you're a busy person, you're an important person, things pile up and, and that's okay. Uh, just make time to process them and prioritize them. Man, I've got this alliteration. I got to write this down. That's, I know. I'm thinking the same <laughs> thing. Process and prioritize. That's pile, awesome. process. Pile. Yeah. You got your pile, you got your process. Perfect. Oh, well, so Chris, I also, you know, one thing we always like to ask as well is, do you have any new and cool resources that you want to share? We've gotten so many from Sanebox and Roll Me, Maelstrom, Funny Hands. Fuzzy fancy hands, hands. Fancy, fancy hands, hands yeah. <laughs> I'm mean, fuzzy hands. That's going to take us somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> but it, do you have any other um, websites, blogs, books, gadgets that are just top of mind right now? Yeah, totally. So I don't, I don't have, I usually have a copy on the desk here, but I wrote a book a couple of years ago that was a hundred hacks to save time in your business. And, awesome. um, and so if anyone wants to go to trainual.com slash book, you can download the book for free. Um, it's, it's on Amazon and everything, but you can get the free digital version. So um, there are just tons of, you know, it's a hundred different hacks for areas of your life or business, but there's maybe two or 300 app recommendations and things in that. So uh, I'm all about that stuff. That's awesome. And we, the world collectively, I can say thank you on behalf of our listeners for doing the work that you do and thinking about something that a lot of us just don't think about. So it's just, it's been so great to have you, Chris. Um, and I just really appreciate your time. I had fun talking to you today. Yeah, likewise. This is great. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for all of our listeners. Um, as you know, this, this is recorded live every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. You can join us every single week and tune in. And you can watch the behind the scenes on Facebook Live. See us chatting a little bit before the session, session starts. And every Tuesday, right? So after our session, our podcast ends every Tuesday. You can check us out on iTunes, Pocket Cast, Stitcher, whatever your favorite podcast app is. And of course, check us out on www.event-icons.com. That gives us those show notes, links to resources shared. Chris gave us so many great ones today. But the best way is to join us live. So sign up 
events, event icon, uh, icons.com and join live on Zoom so we can connect with you. Um, and of course, we want to know what you think. So use the, the Twitter hashtag event icons, join our Facebook group. We are a community here of event professionals. So we want to connect with you, our fellow icons, and continue the conversation. So Chris and I are going to dance it out to the outro together. But thank you, everyone, for tuning in and want you to tune in next week for the the next event, hashtag event icon. So thanks so much. That's right. <laughs> you ready to dance, Chris? Let's do it. All right. There's got to be no feedback, I promise. Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of hashtag event icons. To catch the description and all of the resources mentioned, head to www.helloendless.com slash blog. This week's episode posted and available by next Tuesday. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway. Enjoy the social conversation. Sponsored by Little Bird Told Media. Just tag your post with hashtag event icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on hashtag event icons.